one of the things I like to say about the Ankler, which is so nice and different from other media I've done, is that it's a very intentional audience. They've already, because of the high subscription price, well, I don't think it's high, but I'm sure others do. It's $149 a year. But because of the intentionality of the audience buying in, they're very, very engaged with what we do and, uh, and what we talk about. Welcome back to Media Voices, everybody. We take a look at everything that's going on in the media world over the past week. I'm Chris Sutcliffe. I'm Esther Thorpe. And I'm Peter Houston. And that clip you just heard is from my conversation with Janice Min. She is co-owner and CEO of The Ankler, which is a newsletter-first media brand covering Hollywood and the world of entertainment. So we discussed how The Ankler's revenue streams have evolved over the last 12 months, the potential she sees in lean newsletter-first businesses, and what lessons she's applying from her time at big-name publications like The Hollywood Reporter. Very nice. But before then, what we're going to do is a bit of a back-to-basics episode, because listening back to the past couple of weeks, we have been laser-focused on AI. Now, that's not our fault. That's just what the industry's been doing. Because what we're going to be doing is we're doing a back-to-basics Media Voices 101 using an article that Peter has written as a bit of a basis for this. Well, Jez, Jez at What's New Publishing said, do you want to do, you want to do a, a kind of predictions piece for the end of the year? And my response was, F- no. <laughs> Um, I, I'd love reading other people's predictions pieces, but I hate writing them. Now, is that uh, because you feel like it's, uh, it's putting too much of your reputation on the line? Because I do that. Back to that now. <laughs> I'll do that day in, day out, do this kind of thing by saying things that people can then have a go about. <laughs> no, it's not that. It's just, it's hard. Mm. It's probably hard and it's thankless it's it's just so easy to put something out there and people go that's nonsense so this is effectively what you would like to see from the industry yes and and you know what this is what we talk about if, if this is your first time in the media voices podcast dear listener i love the way you said that media voices 101 it's what we think should be at the basis of every decision I'm actually going to pick at your first wish bit of wish list. Well, I know you would. <laughs> the first thing on Peter's wish list is that he wants to see a pivot to value. This feels very weird, like reading out what you've said when you're literally sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like a trial. This is exactly um, what you wanted to avoid, Peter. What's, that, going what's for that PhD it. thing that people do? Not having a PhD. <laughs> oh, the Viva. It, but yeah. But yeah, Peter, you, you absolutely make the valid point that there are a lot of publishing pivots that end in tears with... We all know the pivot to video that was the really bad one in 2017. Um, but you, you <laughs> this is so weird. Um, you do say here that the pivot to value in contrast places audience at the centre of the chase and will bring significant gains if it ever catches on. Um, Easier said than done. What I'm, actually gonna, <laughs> what I'm actually going to just slightly nitpick at here is I, I think publishers that didn't have a value proposition to start with aren't still around. I think I think... So it should be a pivot back to value. There's a lot of publishers that have lost sight of what their value proposition was. But I think if you didn't have that to start, you wouldn't have got where you are. Even BuzzFeed had a value proposition at the start, which was that it was a great place to waste like half an hour on, on the on the internet. I wouldn't I've, argue I've, with your semantics. Anyone that's been ever been anywhere has started with a value proposition, absolutely. But it was probably a crap value proposition or a hypey value proposition or a value proposition that's got lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, my big one, and this is regional news. Of course, there's a value proposition be regional news, but try finding it now. Yeah. And amongst the whack a mole websites. But it, they would have had to start out with a value proposition in the good old print days because otherwise they wouldn't have got anywhere. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Because we can talk about value and inherent value as much as we want, but when the ecosystem changes so rapidly and so comprehensively. Mm. You know, Kodak is still the poster boy for this. And I think that when we're talking about regional newspapers now, we probably can't do it without talking about the row that erupted over the past couple of weeks, where people started going, actually, you know, Reach is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant regional publisher. And then people kept going, but if, if all that is lost among the noise of the same stories being reused from title to title and all the ads which don't add value, then at what point do we have to say, well, look, 
There, there was an interesting response. I think you talked about this, Chris. So there's an interesting response from some reach people on LinkedIn to some of the stuff that Josh Shee Herman and the guys at Manchester Mill had done. Or, or no, oh no, they hadn't said it. It had been said about them on the BBC. Yeah. And the response from, I think it was David Higgerson, actually, at Reach was absolutely right. You know, he surfaced all sorts of value that that uh, the Manchester Evening News had delivered, you know, in terms of investigative reporting and, and being right and among the community. But you, what the point that you've just made is it all gets lost in amongst all this shite. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're running, st- <laughs> keep bringing this one up, but... When you're running stories about the wrong family eating a KFC, <laughs> then yeah. that investigative reporting is just lost. We'll put it this way. If if I saw that on a content recommendation engine, I would go, yeah, that fits very neatly there. But that story about people eating the wrong KFC doesn't necessarily fit if you're trying to project an image of really exactly. good, really relevant local news. That, that Press Gazette reporting that they did, what was it, last autumn, yeah. where they said this is the... This is the geographical yeah. audience of these different places. And, you know, Reach and National World are both, <laughs> both as well as said, they've both got brands that have got, you know, 75% of their audience are from outside the area that they're covering. And it's like, that's that's not, like, they're not coming because you're covering local stuff. In that case, they're covering, <laughs> they're coming because you're not. And that's where that ad-driven model completely, you know, we've said this a million times, it completely disincentivizes real local reporting. Yeah. And it's a shame because you know there are some people there that do some great work, but that's the you've thing. Got, you know, you've got to go find it. We we can't discount that there are genuinely really really good local reporters on a lot oh. of titles who are working their asses off to cover, say, local court stories, which are the backbone of what local press used to be. But it's getting lost. And how in the frustrating noise. must it be for them to see their reporting put on a site where you've got like a line, four ads, surrounded by ads, pop up ads. And then you have to sort of scroll t- to find where the next two lines are. Like that's got to be gutting. I think the so, problem there is they're trying to do two things that are that are actually mutually exclusive. You're trying to report in a local area which has got, by definition, a limited population, so limited audience. But you're also got a business model, as I just said, that is predicated on shit loads of traffic. Well, talking about subscriptions, the next thing on your wish list is sustainable subscriptions. So why don't you tell us what you mean by that? That's just really a way of having a go at Esther. It's <laughs> <laughs> just to get you out for picking. Yeah. Uh, well, this is, I mean, the point, this is the subscription thing is we we have the hype, don't we? It's peak subscriptions, we're locked down, everyone bought stuff, yay. And then, and then all of a sudden people are going, oh my God, why have I got all these subscriptions? And I think that thing is, it comes back to what media's always been about. Is this worth paying for? Mm. And then as we get into Cozy Lives. Yes. <laughs> no, yes, I did not just say that. Then people are, t- people are l- going through. We've talked about this. People are going through and they're saying, nope, don't need that. Nope, don't need that. Nope, don't need that. Oh, yeah. keep that because I actually use it. Um, well, what a perfect time then to launch or relaunch Twitter Blue, you know, as the, <laughs> as such an inherently valuable talking of value, yeah, such an inherently valuable subscription. People paying eight dollars a month, basically, so that they can keep the same service while Musk makes the rest of Twitter worse. What a brilliant, brilliant business model. Piers now, or we'll make Twitter shit for you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's what they're doing. It's like standing on a lifeboat and going, somebody at the front with a big hammer to knock sections out of the lifeboat going, maybe not if you pay me $8. Mm. <laughs> so beyond beyond Twitter, which we could talk about for forever and gripe about forever, you're talking about um, this well, kind sustainable- of slice. T- yeah, the sustainability bit of this, or the argument that Esther and I have had ongoing for this one, and actually we don't, we're not really arguing, it's a question of emphasis, is the difference between bundles and these narrow salami sliced type uh, subscription products. I think bundles are the way to go, give people more and they will stay. Mm-hmm. Esther sees it more as um, give people the bits they want rather than make them take everything 
I'm just, yeah. I just, you, you're, you're always going to have that ceiling on subscriptions that, you know, if that's 8%, 10%, 15% of your audience are going to be the ones that pay. Is there a way you can increase that to maybe 25, 30% by slicing up? And it's not, it's not slicing up and then not offering anything big. It's, it's, it's open, you know, can you open sort of a little, a little fence to open the big gateway that, you know, you sort of, you're starting that paying, that paid relationship with somebody in the hope that they will then pay for more as they build that relationship with your brand. It's, it's, it's having a date before you get engaged and get married. Whoa. I, I would also put a caveat on that, that it does depend on what kind of publisher you are. So the FT is the one that when they launched um, FT Edit, I thought it's actually a really brilliant idea um, because so much of the FT's reporting is like really high level financial stuff. And they have a very, like, I think they're like what, 30, at least 30 by, 35 pounds a month to subscribe to. That's, if you're not a, a finance professional, that's going to be completely out of your budget for a lot of people. Moving on to something that is very relevant to our business model, which is newsletters and podcasts. Yay! Peter, you were talking about this, I think, from a relationship development and a sort of direct relationship standpoint, weren't you? Yeah. Well, the one thing that newsletters and podcasts do for publishers is get them away from the platforms. Mm. Give them control back. And I know, yes, you're on a podcast platform and yes, you're on a newsletter platform. But you're building a one-to-one relationship that's not mediated by the meta of snap media. I put it in the newsletter, but the media startup since 2000. Yeah. Oh, the first yes. five were all platforms. Yeah. And the type of money that they were talking about made publishers look like chicken feed. Yeah, like absolute jumps. I think that we've still got a bit of a reckoning to come with podcast and platform dependency. But that's actually because I was... Um, uh, no, I wrote an article this week, again, for What's Been Publishing, about NRC and the fact that they've launched... They've basically built and done their own audio app for exactly this reason. They're very, very nervous about the future of podcast apps and they don't want to be reliant on the platforms for those, for their numbers, their their revenue, all that sort of thing. So um, it's it's really, really smart what they've done. It's obviously not something everybody's got the resource to do, but in terms of saying, actually, we want to own that audience, you have to sign in when you download the app. You know, we want to know who you are. We want to know what you're listening to. We want to own that that data uh peter mix of six you coined this term when <laughs> oh did you coin this term or did you nick it from well, somewhere uh i i didn't nick it but i based it on something that david carey at hearst had said years and years and years ago mm-hmm. when he talked about six six revenue stream, streams for sustainability now how you hate predictions you hate doing predictions how close <laughs> do you think we are to actually having most major publishers the the type of media companies that we speak about on this podcast have that mix of six. Yeah, I don't know if it's six, but yeah, they definitely have multiple revenue streams. You've got your traditional newsstand sales or subscription sales. You've got your digital subscription sales. You've got your advertising online and offline. Uh, you've got events which are coming back. The pandemic was a really stark highlight for this, wasn't it? Because pe- people that pretty much overnight ad revenue and live events as revenue streams were completely wiped out. And you had all those huge sort of event media businesses that were just suddenly there like, uh, what do we do? Mm. And people that had another sort of two or three or four streams to fall back on were fine. Um, especially those like future who'd got into e-commerce. Don't forget NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> is that the first mention of NFTs yeah, this year? Yeah, it is. Yeah. We, got, <laughs> we got all the way to mid-end of Feb. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, all the crypto bros have gone into chat GPT now anyway. I saw there was a <laughs> GPU shortage again. Not just because, not because people are using it to mine, to mine like Bitcoin and crypto, but because everybody is now pumping it into chat GPT. <laughs> so it's just the same old problem again. Human beings are just pathetic. <laughs> they are just, just pathetic. That's Moody Voices 101. <laughs> yeah. Human beings are pathetic. Now, how do we monetize them? <laughs> <laughs> Can that be able, we can get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> that is Media Voices 101. So how likely is it, do you think, that we'll be back here again this time in 2024? We'll be discussing exactly this and we'll have exactly these things as the, the topics again. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and moving on to the news in brief. And Haymarket is riding high on a £16.9 million profit announcement. And it's attributing that success to a rebounding live events calendar. We spoke about that in the main body of this podcast. But it's also a case of having invested in event strategy over the course of the past few years. And it's also potentially a good sign for other publishers investing in event tech like News UK, which is doing news live. Um, once. You mean that's not all down to the PodPod launch? It's not all down to PodPod. <laughs> 
Uh, Damien Ratcliffe has been writing for What's New and Publishing. As always, that is a treat. Uh, he's writing this time about e-commerce trends and the implications that they have for publishers and media companies. The biggest one is the disruption of traditional advertising models. Um, as more businesses shift their focus and their advertising budgets towards the e-commerce platforms. Damien points out it's already a priority revenue stream for more than one in four publishers. That's according to Reuters Institute's prediction reports. But what I thought was interesting is with the ad market worth $100 billion and e-commerce predicted mm. to be worth $9 trillion, then that kind of shift in focus absolutely makes sense. Reminds me of a joke about George Bush and the Brazilian, Brazilians. Yeah, I forget. <laughs> Talk of historical figures. Do you guys remember Snapchat? No, I do remember Snapchat. They just announced their user base for the entire world. Then they make glasses. So a lot of people still point. use it. Oh yeah, let's the fact, still use like, it. Um, so anyway, Snapchat. Um, there's a digital article this week that says that um, it's actually still performing pretty strongly as a revenue stream for some publishers. But this uh, th- this piece to point out that actually others are having frustrations, um, which to me just encapsulates the issue with platform publishing strategies. So one unnamed publisher wanted to invest more in their channels after success last year. Um, Snapchat then late last year pivoted away from prioritizing that particular kind of publisher programming. So the publisher then said, okay, fine, we'll launch some new shows on Snapchat, which are apparently being viewed by nobody. So (laughs) we'll link to that in the show notes. It's it's quite an interesting, uh, it's it's quite difficult for me to explain when there's nobody named, but it's it's a very interesting read if you are on Snapchat. The moral of the story? Stay away from platforms, kiddies. <laughs> so this week I spoke to the Ankler CEO and co-founder Janice Min. Janice's career history includes editorial leadership positions at some big legacy names in publishing. So I began by asking her what was appealing about joining a startup and especially one built up around a newsletter. So I had become really enamored of this newsletter um, called... Uh, called the Ankler. And it, I think what was really interesting to me about it was that it was something that definitely punched above its weight. It had a, um, it was this one man show for, for being put out by a journalist I had known for a while, Richard Rushfield. Um, but it was getting read by literally some of the most influential people in town, like many of them. And at the CEO level, at the Oscar winning producer level, um, Someone had described it to me as um, the weekly memo to Hollywood. And to have that kind of influence um, with a really sporadic publishing schedule and through a newsletter, it seemed like a great opportunity. I thought what Richard had done in terms of capturing an audience that's very hard to reach um, with almost no expenses was a pretty great business model. Do you, do you think it was the way he wrote that or do you think it was the fact that it was such a sort of, it was literally just a newsletter and quite simple and quite straightforward that meant that it had this initial success it did. Uh, I think it was, I think it was definitely more the way he wrote and what he said. And having worked at The Hollywood Reporter, which, uh, you know, I was there starting in 2010 and was there for seven years, it became the definitive voice in entertainment. And it was, um, it was playing a different game than what Richard was doing. Uh, you know, all that was the decade of scaled media where you're trying to, you obviously you have direct advertising sales and you're selling that, but you're also trying to get programmatic advertising. And this was like, you would sit around and talk about your comm score number and, oh my God, it hit 23 million unique visitors a month. We're huge. But what does that actually mean? And what Richard was able to do with the anchor was really dilute it um, down to this essential conversation, like this inside conversation within Hollywood that wasn't happening um, at the trade level. Um, it wasn't happening with big consumer entertainment press. He was making something that felt really personal and connected to the audience he was serving. And um, and I, you know, Richard tells a story about how you know, he at first, at first literally began as an email he sent out to some contacts. And then someone suggested he started to pay for it, that he started that people start paying for it and he should put up a paywall. And he said it was terrifying. Like how how will people what if people, no one wants to pay for it? But they did. And he was supporting himself through this through this one person operation. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that the idea of those two extremes. Do you think there's a point where um as the anchor scales up that 
some of that sort of personality might have to get lost? Or do you think that this is something that a sort of new media business can very much do now is be a bit more personality led and less sort of brand led, I suppose? I think one of the things that, that we've kept as we've scaled and we grew a lot over this past year. So it's we just hit our one year anniversary and we uh, we grew our audience Wow, almost quadrupled our audience, and it uh, it's it was all about kind of finding the right way to scale what Richard had done, which was to create this insider conversation and make it even better. And at times, and uh, I would like to think make it made it even smarter. And we had the advantage of also launching at a disadvantageous time in the industry where Netflix was uh, was had reported a subscriber dip and there was chaos and there was consolidation and everyone was a little bit um, at sea. And in times like that, it, it, people really turned to trusted sources for their information. And we, we definitely became one. Uh, and uh, people just uh, were ravenous for better information on how to do their jobs, basically. And the anchor served that niche. I was reading something that, like you have to be really ballsy to start something up in a in a recession. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't a recession then, and might not might still not be a recession, but everyone talks about it um, <laughs> looming over our heads. Uh, but it but that's when people you know when everything's going great in business, you don't need to know as much because you can just ride the wave. But when things are starting to get a little hard on the edges, then uh, that's when information is your friend. So you mentioned it, um, it quadrupled the subscribers. Um, when you when you joined, what have you what did you do to it, and where? Yeah, I suppose what, what have you done over the past year to it? Yeah, I, I think just as someone who um, who became the person running this business, the number one thing was you know no man is an island or no business is an island. To have the whole thing uh, reliant on Richard Rushfield was not a scalable, (laughs) was not a scalable way to grow the business. And so it was about bringing in some other voices and writers. And, uh, and I felt really fortunate that because of, you know, long time with really good relationships between both me and Richard, we were able to kind of beg, borrow and steal and put together a, a really small, but mighty team. And, one of the first people we brought on was someone who goes by the name entertainment strategy guy. And he is basically a, he's a business analyst, a strategy, uh, a, a strategy person who used to work at one of the big streamers in, um, in Hollywood and um, really dissecting the numbers. I think, you know, one of the things, the, one of the moments we're in is there is a real black box around information around who's watching what and where and creators in Hollywood can't get that information out of, the people who are buying their shows in the way that they used to. And so um, to be able to unlock the black box just a little bit through data and research is what Entertainment Strategy Guy does. And that's proven to be incredibly valuable uh, to the audience. And then we wanted to get people into habit. And I think anyone who runs a media organization knows the value of habit. And, um, And so we found... This person, Sean McNulty, who um, was doing on his own a newsletter called The Wake Up uh, that um, somebody from Netflix had said to me was one of the smartest things was or was one of one of this person's must reads in the morning. And um, I contacted Sean and met him and convinced him to bring his really fantastic newsletter over to the Ankler. And I would say, no offense to Richard, I would say Sean is a pretty good rival for, you know, uh, most eyeballs at the Ankler. Um, and then separate from them, really, um, we brought in features, people who could really report and write in depth about topics uh, impacting entertainment. So we are almost concluded with a series we have right now called The Squeeze, which is about how uh, streaming economics have uh, financially impacted negatively um, different groups of people who work in the business, actors, producers, writers. Uh, we are The last one we're going to do is executives. Um, and we also uh, had a series that we just launched um, a few days before you and I are recording. It's called Glimpse of the Future about... Uh, we have one of the stories is about uh, the impact of artificial intelligence coming to Hollywood, including in special effects and script writing with G- chat GPT. And another one was just about the, the competition between the seven streamers and uh, from one of the top attorneys in town 
and why the conversation we're having about them is all wrong. So we're trying to be thoughtful. We're trying to um, we're trying to go under the surface of sort of traffic driven conversation. Uh, we don't do things like, you know, what people say on Twitter about you know this story and that story. I mean, it's been a really nice pleasure to not be in the traffic chasing business, but in the subscriber acquisition business. It's a very different kind of conversation. I think the anchor is profitable from my understanding. It is. It is. I mean, I will tell you that, you know, for our profitability, I mean, it. it's like a, it's a tiny, we are tiny. I mean, you know, uh, for headcount at the moment, we are expanding that. Um, but it was, I think what we really knew we had to do for year one was like, okay, let's prove that the science experiment works and keep our expenses really low. Um, and we did it. So, uh, and part of it was bringing in sponsorship, which had never really been a part of Richard's business when he was a solo practitioner. It's not just purely subscriber revenue. So I suppose what does the rest of that look like? Yeah. So uh, there is a, there's a unique advertising uh community in entertainment that that is would be illogical to most people who are going after consumer advertising uh because of the business of awards in entertainment you have um the emmys and the oscars are the two big ones and a lot of uh campaigning as it's called goes into winning those awards and so um every single one of these shows or movies has sort of two windows of marketing the first one is the release um uh, like, you know, opening day open or, you know, debut on a streaming service and you'll see sort of, you'll, you hopefully we'll see some marketing around that. And the second window is when one of these titles is trying to win an award. And so they will, there are, there are these voting windows in Hollywood uh, where, where people vote on who should get nominated. And there is big campaigning going on around that. And, uh, you know, we, because of the, the audience we reach, we've been able to charge you know, a nice uh, sponsorship fee to have any anyone's message go directly to our audience. This is a fascinating behind the scenes insight about how these awards work. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> it doesn't happen rarely. Does it happen organically? I know I, maybe some of your listeners were following this controversy around this actress nominated for best actress, Andrea Riseborough, who did not run a campaign. It was all kind of you know. Uh, influencer friends, Kate Blanchett saying something, you know, on, on another awards show that kind of led to this word of mouth campaign. But that uh, very, very, very rarely happens. Yeah. Yeah. And I did notice that the anchor itself it is it is pretty much entirely on Substack. Does that um does that make you a bit nervous given your your background and experience with other publications that are spread a bit more across different platforms? I will say this about Substack. We could not, we could not have gotten off to such a running start without it. Like it, like to not have to build a website, you know, uh, debug a website, uh, manage all of that and uh, not to make those technical decisions that really, that is not the expertise of me or, or my, certainly not my expertise and it's not Richard's. And it just allowed us to start publishing like very quickly right away. And that's how we grew. And that's how we uh, were able to do some really fantastic work uh, out of the gate. So Substack has been an excellent partner. I also think Substack is trying to keep up with brands such as the Anchor that they, that could be seen as outgrowing Substack. You know, Substack really began as a great place for single author newsletters. Um, And I think that they're making some shifts to try to accommodate, um, you know, many many empires on their platform of which, you know, we would certainly like to qualify as one of those, call ourselves one of those. So they've become, you know, they've been, they've been good partners to us um, and are definitely trying to broaden the definition of who and what should be on Substack. Yeah. Are there any other things you're looking to launch on, like maybe a website or a podcast or anything like that? Yeah, we have podcasts and they do quite well. And we actually, I think, you know, most people don't think of Substack as a podcasting platform, but they do. We do. They launched it recently. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So we, the Ankler has, we are the second business, second biggest business publication on Substack. And we also have the third most listened to 
podcast. And um, so, yes, we, we would like to do, po- you know, certainly more podcasting and more regular podcasting, but we have it there. And uh, and so that that's those are that's an extension we've done with the Angler. And then this year we're going into events like it's I think for anyone who is a listener to, of your podcast knows that brands, you know, media brands live it's a pretty flat experience to just experience them on a website or in the written word. And, and because of, we can curate a pretty incredible audience uh, and um, style of event given who is in our ecosystem. And one of the things I like to say about the Ankler, which is so nice and different from other media I've done is that it's a very intentional audience. They've already, because of the high subscription price, well, I don't think it's high, but I'm sure others do. It's $149 a year. But because of the intentionality of the audience buying in, they're very, very engaged with what we do and uh, and what we talk about. And that is certainly like a freedom that allows you to um, write a certain way, speak a certain way, and then also kind of cater. I mean, we have information on our subscribers. We know who they are. Um, but it, it definitely enables us to cater um, what we create and say around that audience. Yeah. Are there lessons you've taken either, I suppose, editorial in terms of tone or more business focus that that you've learned from your time working at publications like The Hollywood Reporter that you're you're applying to the Angler? So I mean, that they are such different businesses. Yeah, I mean, sure. I think all of it is like good content, right? People, it's not like you know, you're not reinventing the wheel, like people like good content and they like content that they feel they can't get other places. And so I've always been mindful as an editor, not to be the place that is rewriting someone else's really good story and doing your version of it. Of course, you're going to do that on certain big stories, but to be able to create an original reporting or original thoughts and analysis, that is what the value is in media. Like it's not, you know, I mean, it's not, chasing trending stories or clickbait stuff or, uh, you know, engaging in, you know, outrage wars or whatever. So I would like to think that like, you know, I think the biggest attribute, the comp- the highest compliment someone could pay, certainly to the Hollywood Reporter and to the Angler would be that it's smart, uh, that it's sophisticated. And I would also add a third adjective in that, in that it's fun. And in terms of uh, sort of potential future expansion, you've mentioned events. Um, when it comes to publishing via a newsletter, there's a bit of a sort of ceiling as to, I suppose, how often and what you can publish, especially if it's all substack driven. Where do you see the main opportunities for expansion and growing in terms of, I suppose, editorial? Yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we would talk about, when we talk about entertainment, we really thought of it as Hollywood and um, this little small world out here in Los Angeles. Um, entertainment has expanded enormously. and I've, you know, if any of your listeners would like to become the writer for Ankler London, I am uh, all ears. Um, so, you know, we would like to, we would like to start, we would like to recognize and acknowledge the expansion of the entertainment business around the globe. We do think that there is an opportunity there. Um, we have a very successful spinoff already called The Optionist, which is about intellectual property, which is the foundation of how every single project, uh, film or film or TV series ever take shape in the entertainment business. And so, um, you know, I'll give you an example. If the Ankler is $149 a year, the option is to be charged $2,500 a year. And that does quite well for us. And so we believe there's opportunity both abroad and but also going deeper into the various niches that um, are really essential to know more about for various professions within this business. Um, so I think you will see some more of those coming out from us. Uh, hopefully this year. It reminds me a bit of the kind of Axios model where they, because they, their newsletter first is when they started with just one vertical and then just kind of expanded into all the others. Sure. Yeah. No, they, I mean, I think that, you know, lots of places have, I have figured out that people need greater depth of information, not more information. Um, and, you know, the thing, the, like, the thing I always say is people never say they don't have enough to read, but they don't have enough essential stuff to read. In that case, to what extent do you think organisations like the Ankler are the future of media um, and possibly the ones to survive the next 50 years rather than perhaps the legacy publications? 
you know, media survival is a really, <laughs> no one can really predict it. I think you see we're in this wave right now where um, BuzzFeed, you know, the titans of the last decade, uh, Vice, Vox, BuzzFeed, they've all chosen different routes for their for future planning. Um, and that was kind of like the so a lot of it's social media led scale media, right? Um, and and now I would like to think, at least in terms of the Angler, I mean, then there was a sort of a newsletter boom that may still exist. Um, and uh, but it's that sort of direct relationship to the audience that I think is is just just has such a high value, um, both to the um, you know, both to the consumer of it, but also um, you know, to the, to the outside world that like you to be able to have ownership and thought leadership in one single space is, um, is really meaningful. So I think that you will see some, a lot of success in, um, these, these small high impact audiences that, uh, that, uh, are getting built and stood up out of, you know, thin air and, um, so I think that you will see a lot of success with that. And I, you know, so I, do I think it's all going to be like big, huge things like the New York Times and tiny profitable things like the Ankler? Uh, I think you're seeing success on both ends of that equation. And in the middle is, there's just so many question marks hanging over all of that. I just think it's interesting. Yeah, the, um, the athletics and the brand that comes to mind that started as a similar thing where they went very, very deep into, into sports, but, you know, they're still not profitable. So... Right, right. Yeah, so the athletic uh, was part of the same um, place where we launched, which is Y Combinator, which is a Silicon Valley uh, accelerator speed fund. And so the athletic is really the only media property that preceded us in Y Combinator. Uh, but they, you know, they would probably the founders would probably tell you they had a great outcome because they sold to the New York Times for five hundred whatever fifty million or whatever that final price was. But um, yeah. Exactly. Um, so I'd like to think we have some protection against some of what the athletic was criticized for because we have a much higher uh, subscriber subscription price. And I would probably imagine less churn because, um, you know, people aren't, aren't popping in and out when their favorite teams aren't in season or, uh, or playing and, uh, and, you know, entertainment. If you work here, it's a 24-7 existence. The last thing we ask all our guests is what's the last thing you read or saw that really affected you? It can be like a Netflix film or a podcast or a, an article. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, okay, I'll name two things. So, and I'm not saying this just because this is because you're British. Um, I, Prince Harry's book, Spare, I, I devoured. Um, and it was uh, it was just you know, riveting, riveting to have these sides of, um, it's really truly the, uh, one of the biggest untold stories of, um, you know, of, of modern times to hear the other side of the Royal family was incredible. Um, and then a book called the late comer, uh, which was a, I think a decently, a, a very well-reviewed book, a novel about a family in New York city and it's, and their travail through a few generations was the last was the last book I completed and it was fantastic. Um, and then Fauda, I love Fauda. Uh, I've watched all four seasons now of Fauda, and that is the last show I finished. And uh, and Fleischman is in trouble on Hulu. And don't forget that the Publisher Podcast Awards shortlist is now live at publisherpodcastawards.com. It is a fantastic shortlist. We are so impressed by the amount of effort and thought that has gone into every single one of the shortlisted podcasts. And tickets are now on sale. That is publisherpodcastawards.com. It's going to be another fantastic night. And if you can't get enough of Publisher Awards, <laughs> the Publisher Newsletter Awards will be opening soon. And the categories are live. Yes, live on publishernewsletters.com Until next week when we will be back with a fantastic episode and another tour through our wish list for what publishers should be doing in the next year and beyond. Thank you for listening and bye. Bye bye.